the slow movement of the hunting crocodile, the grazing peace of the manatee, chattering monkeys in trees, lemon sharks hunting crustaceans. These are all present in mangrove swamps. These deltas are some of the richest biomes in our world and form a bulwark against the violence of the sea. But what does it offer you, the fantasy world builder? Should you make mangroves in your world? What kind of magic can you build there? What sort of civilization would suit such a biome best? That is the topic of my video today. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you like this kind of content and you would like to help me keep making it, you can hit my Ko-fi page, link down below, where you can leave a once-off donation or become a monthly member. Alternatively, I am a fantasy author and my books are available on Amazon.com, link to my author profile down below. If you do buy them and read them, please do leave a review. Thank you to all my current supporters who have helped make all this worth it. Okay, let's crack on. So the first thing that we have to talk about when it comes to mangroves is the plant itself. It is mangroves, after all. Mangrove forests, or swamps, or sometimes called mangels, occur in subtropical and tropical areas. They are estuaries, they form in marine borders or in deltas, basically where fresh water meets the ocean, you have the potential for a mangrove forest. In this kind of environment, it actually creates an incredibly complicated biome for a plant because the sea brings salt into land, right? And then the tide goes out, leaving the water body sitting there in the sun. Now, the sun causes evaporation of the water, which makes the water even saltier. So you have the salinity of the water going up. Then what happens is the salt water comes back from the ocean as the tide comes in and you've got the water going back to its kind of salty level and you have water coming in from inland bringing additional mineral content, potentially bringing more fresh water and so on. So the closer you get to the ocean point, the more kind of saltish your water can be and it can be in fact saltier than the ocean itself due to the evaporation effect. So from a plant perspective, the plant that survives and thrives in such an environment must be capable of dealing with salt. It must be capable of dealing with a changing environment. It must be capable of dealing with changing temperatures as the water is cooler and, you know, the sun bakes it to heat and so on. So it is an incredibly hardy plant that can tolerate a broad range of environmental factors. Now, of course, this means that mangroves have to be capable of dealing with salt filtration as well. They have to be capable of extracting water from salt. The red mangrove is actually the best at salt filtration. And what it does is it has this very impenetrable root system. So the roots grow over each other, kind of blocking the bulk of the seawater in and creating a natural barrier. Then its roots are also impregnated by suburin, which is a plant epidermis, which further keeps out the salt. Studies have shown that inside the plant, the water that's actually absorbed into the plant, is 90 to 97 percent of the salt has actually been excluded from that plant. That is how good their salt filtration system is. The red mangrove can also store its salt in specific cells manufactured for that process. The white and the gray mangroves actually shed their salts. So they've got special little glands where they excrete salt that they've absorbed from the ocean into those glands. And you can see the crystalline salt structures forming on the side of the mangrove itself, which is just amazing. And if you think about how valuable salt was for human communities before we could reliably mine it, that could make mangroves a highly sought-after environment for humans to live in with that kind of ready access to salt. But it is not just the salt that makes this kind of environment a difficult environment. These plants also have to live in a low oxygen environment because it is a very muddy, very swampy environment with not a lot of oxygen in the actual land because it's 
obviously drowned in water the whole time. The black mangrove has come up with a really amazing way for its roots to breathe. It has what you can only really describe as so straw roots that actually stick up like 30 centimeters above the ground and they, they breathe, they sit up and breathe the air and carry the oxygen down to the deeper roots that are underneath the mud. So I thought that was just a really like cool evolutionary process that gave the mangrove these uh, straws that it can breathe with. Such a tree, of course, also requires a means of survival as a young tree. And in fact, the mangrove is very interesting in that aspect. Now, its seeds do float, so the seeds could float from area to area. But it is also one of the very few trees that germinate while still attached to the mother plant. This is called a viviparous tree. These seeds then sprout while they're attached to the plant, and they become a propugule, a ready-to-go seedling, that can produce its own food via photosynthesis. This propugule then drops into the water once it's, you know, ready to go. It drops into the water, and it can remain dormant for over a year while it's drifted from location to location by the water. Even in a desiccated state where it's not taking in any water, it's not taking in any salt, nothing. It's just lying there. And then when it reaches a place that the plant determines is suitable for germination, it will then change its density so that it floats vertically rather than horizontally. So when it's in a state of like transportation, it floats horizontally and then it, it can turn itself, it can make itself denser and float vertically. And then it will attempt to take root. If it can't take root in the place where it has become so dense, it can then remove that density going back to a horizontal position and the water can take it further, which is just an amazingly cool phenomena of this plant. The benefits of real world mangroves, so the benefits mangroves offer us as humans, is that they protect coastal areas from erosion. They form a storm surge barrier, especially against tsunamis and cyclones and other such violent storms that come in from the ocean. Mangroves protect the land from those effects. They also slow down tidal water enough to make the water going out deposit any ground that it's picked up. This then results in the ground around the mangrove becoming more fertile. So mangroves actually alter and build up their environment by increasing the fertility of the ground. And of course, the thick roots, that kind of dense interwoven roots, make the mangroves ideal for the nursery of young fish life. So they are used as a nursery by sharks and by all kinds of other coral fish life, reef fish life. And I will talk more about the mangrove roots and their nursery effect later in this video. So in short, these are actually quite incredible trees. But this is a fantasy world building channel. What does it suggest to us if we look at the magic of a mangrove? First, that kind of protective element, both the protection against the storm and the nursery protection of protecting young life, to me suggests a protection-based magic system, maybe based on sympathetic magic, so as below, as the roots protect, so they protect something else. Maybe even have the mangroves be sentient and have them protect something in the heart of the mangrove forest, and they all form this protective dense growth around the secret area that they're protecting, or this item that they're protecting, or even a magical source that they're protecting. You could also lean into the nursery aspect and look towards fertility magic. And because mangroves are so very difficult to navigate, you could perhaps look at some kind of magic effect around secrets and lies. So mangroves encourage secrets or they can be keepers of secrets or, or maybe the druids who look after the mangrove forests are also keepers of secrets and 
you can really lean into that secretive, protective nature of mangroves in terms of the kinds of magic that you put in there. But protection is not the only thing they do. As we saw, they also filter salt out of water, making water usable by man and beast. So you could also give mangroves cleansing magic. You could maybe include component magic that uses mangrove bark to make a cleansing paste that will cure poisons or maybe remove disease or something like that. You could also look at it for healing magic for the same reason, that kind of cleansing effect. And then, of course, there's mangroves' ability to cope with everything and the way that they breed, their ability to be in a desiccated state for a year and more before they actually take root. So to me, that implies that they're hardy and you could maybe build survivor type magic in there. So you eat a mangrove leaf and, you know, you can live for a week on that alone. Maybe your constitution is increased if you want to look at it in D&D terms, if you consume the bark of a mangrove tree. Maybe you want to have a race based on mangroves, the mangroves themselves being sentient, and they would be a race that would be very adaptable and accepting of change, which would make quite a difference to the normal tree end trope, because the tree end trope is of a people who are slow to change. But given the kind of environment that mangroves live in, you could very potentially have a tree end race that is based on mangroves that would be very adaptable to change. So if you want to have that kind of plant-based race in your world, it might do you good to look at man mangroves and think about the type of tree end they would make. And then, of course, you must think of it in terms of the culture that such a place would engender, the kinds of legends and teachings and religions that would exist around a tree that is a hardy tree, a tree that is capable of turning salt water into actual water, a tree that protects the young of everything around it. I could see such a culture becoming a very nurturing culture, but a very hardy one. So one with perhaps very intense adulthood ceremonies, where you have to survive days in the desert and all of that kind of thing to prove you, you are an adult, but also one where children are extremely well protected and looked after, the way the mangrove roots look after the children of all who are brought before it. So think about the kind of like, cultural aspects that could grow if your people evolved in the shadows of a mangrove. And if you enjoyed those speculations about the plant, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about the animals that exist in a mangrove forest. So mangrove forests are, of course, reptile heaven. There are crocodiles, alligators, snakes, all sorts that exist in this kind of environment. And they are, of course, some of the best predators in terms of both land-based and amphibious predators. Not the absolute best predators, because there are sharks, as we'll talk about in due course. But these kinds of animals do need to eat. And the proboscis monkey provides good eating for both snakes and crocodiles and gators. Now, proboscis monkeys are particularly interesting in that they have a troop mentality. so they always on the lookout for like crocodiles and so on together and they feed together. But they've also specifically evolved to eat the mangrove leaf. Therefore, their bellies have become almost like a fermentation chamber, like they almost ferment the mangrove leaf as they eat it. Now, what is really interesting about the proboscis monkey is if you take it and you make a sentient race out of them, they have evolved with the mangrove. They have seen the way that the mangrove protects them, fish, other creatures, but they are also aware of the dangers offered by reptiles, by crocodiles and snakes and so on. So they would have, I think, that kind of culture that I spoke about earlier, a culture where it doesn't matter whose child it is, all children are protected, but a child to become an adult must prove that they are as strong and as hardy as the mangrove. So I think that you could take a look at the proboscis monkey and maybe make out of that 
a sentient species that is both well adapted to the mangrove as well as has a culture in keeping with their environment. But of course, they are not our only species of animals. Indeed, I spoke previously about mangroves when I spoke about the tides and the effect of two moons and so on. And the tides really does have a fundamental effect on mangroves because the sea brings food in. Then the sea retreats, leaving the mudflats. When the mudflats are open, the crustaceans, the crabs, come out and they feed on the mudflats. And then, of course, when the sea starts coming back, the crabs all scuttle for their holes. And the reason why they scuttle for their holes is because the tide doesn't just bring food. It also brings predators. Specifically, it brings sharks. Now, the lemon shark actually uses the mangrove as a nursery. Mother sharks will come into the mangrove and give birth to their pups in the mangrove. They won't stay to look after the kids. They'll give birth and then they'll head back to the ocean. But the pups, the lemon shark pups, will remain in the mangrove until they're like 10, 15 years old and until they're big enough to face the dangers of the open ocean. So these sharks actually stay quite a long time within the mangroves. Sharks aren't the only fish who use the mangroves in this way. Indeed, the coral reef fish use the mangrove so extensively that any coral reef that has a mangrove close to it has got up to 25% more fish life than coral reefs that don't have a mangrove close to it. Now, of course, there are birds who have evolved to take advantage of this very rich prey. And among those are the lava heron, which has evolved to be a spear-fishing bird. But there's also the cassowaries, and that's a very interesting bird because they're one of those birds where the male makes the nest and then he sits by the nest. And the females come to the nest, they mate, the female lays her eggs in the male's nest and she goes on to the next male. The male waits. Another female come, they mate, eggs drop, female goes. And eventually the male is left with like a, a nest full of eggs. He sits on it and he's the one who hatches the eggs. He's the one who looks after the, the chicks. Cassowary chicks are raised by their single fathers. And that to me is always interesting in terms of the role reversal of genders. So if you have a species based on the cassowary birds, you have a bird people in your world, it would be interesting what kind of society would evolve from that. As I spoke about in my When Does a Matriarchy Make Sense video, I think that societies based on birds would have a higher chance of being a matriarchal society simply because of the reversal of who looks after the chicks. And I think that that is the effect of laying the egg externally as opposed to having the egg be a live birth. That's just a personal theory. You're welcome to let me know what you think in the comments below. Of course, many birds also migrate to mangrove swamps. And indeed, these birds form massive colonies where there are multiples of types of birds that nest together because they all fulfill different evolutionary niches so they don't hunt each other which again speaks to that community that builds up within a mangrove forest. But birds are not the only thing that migrates to a mangrove. Green turtles are long-distance swimmers. They cover huge portions of the oceans. And for them, mangroves represent a safe place to rest because the mangrove is warm. The waters of the mangrove are warm. And so the green turtle will come there and will rest in the warm water. Indeed, manatees too make their winter home in the mangroves because the, the water there is warm enough for this sea mammal. The only sea mammal, by the way, that is a vegetarian sea mammal. Besides migratory animals and sea animals, you also have some of the truly strangest animals in mangroves. The mudskipper fish is like a weird combination of a fish who wants to become a frog. He has ambitions that way. So that he still has gills. And in fact, 
mud skippers have to go to a puddle every now and again and then kind of roll their heads so that the gills get wet so that they can breathe and then they go skipping across the mud again. And like the crabs, they hide in burrows when the tide is coming in because otherwise they get eaten. But when the tide is out, they come out and they feed off the land, off the dry land, and they can in fact jump and crawl quite well on their fins, which is a very interesting evolution of a not really what I would call amphibious animal, an animal that is on its way perhaps to becoming an amphibious animal. There are even mammals that are unique to mangrove swamps. There's a miniature deer that hides out in mangroves that has a tolerance for salt water because, of course, even further inland from the actual sea edge, the water is still pretty brackish. So any animals do have to be able to cope with that salt water. And of course, they do eat mangrove leaves. So you could have the same kind of effect if the mangrove leaf is magic, that these deer are actually quite hardy and difficult to kill. What do people get out of mangrove swamps? Well, they get tannins for making leather. Mangroves become peat, which of course makes fuel for fire. Of course, you could use the wood as well. Mangroves can be made into teas and into medicines, especially in a fantasy world where you can really lean into that medicinal effect and that salt filtration effect. They can also be used as a tobacco substitution. So if you want to play with kind of addictive substances, you could have the mangrove be slightly addictive. And you could also harvest salt from the mangroves, as I spoke about earlier. Then, of course, mangroves, being the meeting place of the sea and the, and the land, would make a good place if you have seagoing races like merpeople or maybe some kind of like intelligent dolphin, and you have land races, men or maybe these monkeys. The mangrove waters could be a place where they meet and trade because it is the unification of both areas. Both people could become conjoined there. It would especially be interesting if the sea people use the mangroves as a nursery while the land people still live in the trees above the mangrove, like some deal or arrangement might need to be reached so that the land people help look after the sea people's young which would make for a very interesting dynamic between the two peoples, especially, as I said, if your land-based people evolve to think that all young should be protected kind of deal. It is a very diverse habitat and a great addition, in my mind, to a fantasy world. It gives you a place where the sea and the land meet. It gives you a place where magic can become a very central part of the plant life itself, a place of protection and power, a place where you can have strange animal and new life comes to adulthood. And those are my thoughts on mangroves in a fantasy world. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button and maybe check out my video on how to build an island. And if you want to connect around this or any other topic, I do have a Discord server linked down below. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just in Time World.